Risen 2 is a semi-open world pirate-themed action-adventure RPG by Piranha Bytes, which released in April of 2012 to mixed reviews, with the general consensus basically being that it had some fun ideas and entertaining elements that were unfortunately marred by frustrating gameplay designs and poor mechanical execution. It didn't help that the game released in a horrendous technical state, with tons of performance issues, broken mechanics, and outright missing features, only some of which was addressed with later patching, after all the major review sites had already finished playing and reviewing it. Perhaps equally problematic to its unimpressive reception at the time was how much it deferred from its predecessor, the generally well-received Risen 1, which felt like a quaint, modernized send-up of the first two Gothic games, which many people consider to be some of their favorite RPGs of all time. With Risen 2, the hope among fans was that it would continue the legacy of the first game, Gothic 2 style, by carrying over the core mechanics of Risen 1 and maintaining all of its good aspects, while simply expanding the scope of the world, fleshing out some of the mechanics, and adding some all new content and features to the mix. Instead, what we got was more of a Gothic 3 treatment, with Piranha Bytes abandoning practically everything that made Risen 1 such a fun and enjoyable experience and giving us something almost completely different, with the first game sword and sorcery late medieval fantasy setting replaced with a more modern, renaissance-era pirate setting, the story shifting focus from defeating the titans who are actively ravaging the world to fleeing the warring titan lords, which are different from titans, with a newfound emphasis on cinematic presentation, lots of bizarre changes to the lore and story to accommodate these new changes in theme and setting, like the purpose of Titan Lords or what the ancient temples are supposed to be, the world design changing from a single large map to a hub-based system of smaller, individual islands done seemingly for the sake of being able to sell new islands as DLC, an all-new combat system that bears no resemblance to the original games with certain features like shields, staves, axes, and magic, and, at least initially, basic actions like dodging removed in favor of things like guns, dirty tricks, and voodoo dolls, a departure from Piranha Bytes' typical three-faction system to a two-faction system where you don't even actually join your chosen faction or progress through their ranks, plus lots of other new features that have never been present in previous Piranha Bytes games like persistent companion characters, quick-time events, and gimmicky mini-games, combined with other weird changes like the complete removal of freeform climbing, swimming, and diving, being able to heal instantly from the pause screen with no animations, or how most consumable items magically turn into generic provisions in your inventory inventory to name just a few examples. It's such a radically different experience, from the theme and setting to the actual gameplay mechanics, that it could have been its own standalone game, as it bears little to no resemblance to the first Risen. In fact, I'd say there are times when it doesn't even feel like a Piranha Bytes game, and instead feels like a poor imitation of a Bioware game. This to me is most evident in the storytelling that emphasizes the characters and cutscenes, combined with the hub-based world design where each hub houses its own self-contained main story arc, which you can do in a somewhat non-linear order, and the whole gameplay aspect of assembling your crew who act like party members while having your pirate ship that acts sort of like your home base, all of which feels more reminiscent of games like Knights of the Old Republic, Mass Effect, and Dragon Age, more so than Gothic or Risen except without the budget to pull it off properly and without a proper understanding of what makes those specific design elements work in a Bioware game. As a result, it doesn't have quite the same core appeal as a Piranha Bytes game, but at the same time it doesn't function on the same level as a Bioware game either, so it just kind of falls between the cracks like a subpar version of arguably better games. I played Risen 2 back when it first launched. In fact, I was so excited for it that I actually pre-ordered it and was playing it the day it released. And although I enjoyed certain aspects of its design, I ultimately came away feeling massively disappointed and underwhelmed by it. I didn't necessarily hate it, but I was so indifferent towards it overall that I couldn't even bring myself to write a proper review on my blog. I only managed an early impressions piece, and once I finished my playthrough I basically just wanted to move on and forget about it. Coming back to it now, almost 10 years later, I find that I appreciate certain things a little more than I did originally, and knowing in advance how different it would be, and thus trying to enjoy it more as its own standalone game, not necessarily as a sequel to Risen, made it a little more of an enjoyable experience. But I still found it lacking in a lot of areas that I typically expect from Piranha Bytes, while also having some really annoying and frustrating issues holding it back from being wholly enjoyable. Set some time after the first game, the main character, who was previously responsible for banishing the Fire Titan on Faranga and releasing the spirit of Ursigor, the Titan Lord who originally imprisoned the Fire Titan, has now joined up with the Inquisition and apparently turned into a drunken bum in the process, while Ursigor and another Titan Lord are now warring with each other on the mainland for the right to conquer the world, or something. 
That's the backstory, at least. The main plot deals with stopping Mara, another alleged Titan Lord who's terrorizing the high seas with her pet Kraken and preventing the Inquisition from escaping the ruins of the old world to the new, undiscovered world to the south. To that end, you become a spy for the Inquisition, attempting to align yourself with various feuding pirate captains, some of whom have sided with Mara and others who've sided against her, in an effort to acquire the four Titan artifacts, one possessed by each of the pirate captains, whose combined power is the only known way to defeat Mara. The rest of the game has you sailing to various islands completing quests as either an Inquisition musketeer or a voodoo pirate, and working with or against various pirate captains in your efforts to acquire the four titan artifacts before battling Mara at the end of the game. Right off the bat, Risen 2 sets itself apart from its predecessor with a bunch of bizarre changes of the setting and lore. There's the obvious shift in era, of course, with the sudden, widespread prevalence of firearms in place of more traditional ranged weaponry like the bows and crossbows from the first game, or how broadswords, warhammers, and battle axes have been universally replaced with piercing rapiers and curved sabers, along with a convenient excuse to outlaw magic in the wake of the events on Faranga, even if the justification doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But the fundamental premise of the story has even been altered to the point that it doesn't feel like a continuation of Risen 1's main plot. The ultimate point of Risen 1 was, the Titans have risen, we have to stop them, and suddenly in Risen 2, the Titans are barely mentioned at all, and now the threat is apparently the Titan Lords, who in Risen 1 were responsible for imprisoning the Titans. My kind forged mighty artifacts and used their power to force the Titans into imprisonment, freeing the world for humanity. A few throwaway lines attempt to explain some of these changes, but there's still a lot that goes left unexplained, like who Ismail is, why Ursigor is suddenly trying to conquer the world or whatever, what's going on with the actual titans, plus other weird inconsistencies like the fact that there are still ancient temples with traps and puzzles to navigate, but now they're no longer buried ruins literally rising from the ground with the appearance of the titans, but are long-standing tombs and places of ancestral communion that the natives have been using for hundreds of years. We combine all this with the newfound emphasis on the pirate theming, and it makes Risen 2 feel largely disconnected from Risen 1, like they wanted to create a brand new game altogether but felt constricted to the Risen IP for the sake of brand recognition and sales, and only did a cursory job of trying to tie things in with the established IP by merely slapping a coat of Risen colored paint over it. A few recurring characters and plot elements, like Patty and her quest to find her father's buried treasure, lend it some semblance of continuity, but for the most part it just does not feel like a sequel to Risen 1, especially when you factor in the apparent Bioware influences and all the mechanical changes to the gameplay systems. That's not inherently a bad thing if the game itself is good and entertaining, which in this case I would say is questionable, but it does make the initial experience feel very off-putting when the very start of the game presents you with so many bizarre and nonsensical changes to the backstory, lore, setting, and even the main plot. Despite those kinds of weird inconsistencies with the first game, the actual story of Risen 2 is unquestionably its strongest asset and the area where it shines most relative to other Piranha Bytes games. For the most part, the storytelling in these games is just a framework to set up gameplay scenarios with some kind of basic progression from beginning to end. They often feel like more of a premise than an actual story. The story in Risen 1, for instance, is basically just a bunch of arbitrary item collecting. Gather fragments of the golden disc so you can enter the main dungeon, and then gather titan armor so you can fight the final boss, most of which you accomplish through repetitive dungeon crawling, with very few interesting characters or plot twists informing those steps along the way. Like with the Gothic games, the appeal in Risen 1 isn't so much the story itself, but the world and the ways in which you're able to immerse and engage yourself within it. The story is merely meant to service the world and gameplay. Risen 2 takes something of an opposite approach by making the story the centerpiece of its design, with the entire game built in service of the story. Setting aside Piranha Bytes' typically linear, chapter-based story progression, Risen 2 instead opts for a non-linear chapter system where the world is divided into various islands, each housing its own chapter of the story, essentially, with the player free to bounce around between them and complete them in whatever order you like after completing the first two islands. Each chapter, and thus each island, centers around one specific adventure in the process of retrieving the four Titan artifacts, each with its own story and characters, complete with a full story structure of exposition, rising action, conflict, climax, and resolution. Each chapter gives you a variety of unique character interactions, usually centered around one or two main characters and various supporting characters as you explore some kind of all-new island, with some kind of notable set-piece encounter or twist to make each chapter memorable and exciting. 
Some of these adventures are actually pretty fun and interesting, and it's the narrative context of these quests that make the main story so engaging, just with the storytelling alone. In one chapter, for example, you're working with one of the pirate captains, Slain, to round up supplies for his ship so that the two of you can set out to retrieve his Titan artifact, which he has hidden away on another island, and then on the way to your destination you end up shipwrecked and stranded on an island full of gnomes where you have to work with them to build a raft to sail back, and then you have to find a way to reunite with your crew before getting back on course tracking down the artifact. This one questline has multiple major events, and a few twists that I haven't revealed here, that change the course the adventure takes, which keeps you on your toes reacting to new circumstances and thrusting you forward into new situations demanding your immediate reaction. It doesn't just feel like a tedious checklist to accomplish, in other words, like the story kind of felt in Risen 1 at times. Another interesting thing to note is that a surprising amount of the game's content actually pertains directly to the main questline. Although many quests seem like they might be unrelated side quests, the majority of them end up being necessary to complete your overarching goal on each island. In the previous example with Slain, he needs you to do a bunch of things around the harbor in Antigua in order to get his ship ready to set sail, which includes things like getting some cannons from the blacksmith, gunpowder from the storekeeper, water from the water carriers, fish from the fishermen, and so on each of which has its own little subquest to help them out with some problem before they'll give you their aid, which in turn requires you to explore the island and complete some other encounter elsewhere. Each quest is initially presented as just some kind of problem around town that needs to be resolved, and which you can get involved in for the sake of your own personal rewards and desires, independently of the fact that Slain needs these things done. It feels like you're doing an unrelated side quest, in other words, and then you later find out that you actually needed to be doing these things for the main quest anyway, and so it ends up feeling doubly productive once all is said and done. With so many of the game's apparent side quests actually being part of the main quest, it gives each island and each quest you complete on each island an intentional feeling of purpose because so much of the game's content is designed in service of some greater context. Each island is designed in service of the main plot to obtain one of the four Titan artifacts, most of the quests are designed in service of fulfilling this overarching objective, and most of the landmass is designed in service of these specific quests. There's a central focus to just about everything you do. It doesn't feel like a bunch of random, unrelated ideas that have been thrown together for the sake of filling out the game space with things to do or padding out the total playtime with extra filler. It's not like Gothic 3, for instance, where so many towns, quests, NPCs, and environments feel repetitively churned out to meet a production quota, thus making a lot of them feel superfluous and meaningless. In Risen 2, just about everything has a specific purpose and contributes in some way to the central plot. Even when the quests aren't relevant to the main story, or don't have much compelling storytelling of their own, there's pretty solid contextualization given to help tie the quest objectives and quest givers into the greater environment and world building. A quest like The Beast in the Lake serves as your most basic type of typical RPG side quest, where you just kill a nearby creature and report back for your reward, but the opportunity is simultaneously used to establish a little bit of the Marakai culture, in terms of their hunter-gatherer society and how some of them provide food for the village by spearfishing in the nearby river, and how they honor their ancestors by adopting the same roles as their forefathers. Another quest in Marakai has you simply fetching four fire peppers from a nearby plateau, but it's not just about the peppers. There's a crazed doctor in the village whose incessant preaching is driving the locals mad, so you're gathering ingredients to make a spicy dish to feed to him that'll burn his mouth so he'll stop talking, which is a unique premise with some interesting character interactions mixed in as well. These are some of the most simple and straightforward quests in the game, but there's still unique context given to why these characters would have you do these particular objectives while making it relevant to this specific area. This extends to the rest of the quest design as well, with every quest, big or small, feeling custom tailored for each island in a way that makes them feel plausibly realized and fully integrated with the rest of the setting. So even when you're doing bog-standard fetch quests without much depth or complexity to them, they don't necessarily feel like bog-standard fetch quests. The quest design isn't terribly sophisticated overall, as it is mostly a straightforward matter of go here, find this, kill this, report back kind of situations, but the contextualization helps to make even these simple objectives more interesting and engaging than they could have been otherwise. That's not to say the quests are all mechanically simple, however. Some of the quests provide decent role-playing options to solve them in different ways, depending on how you've built your character, and in some cases which faction you've chosen to align yourself with. The options aren't as expansive or comprehensive as some other RPGs, but there's some extra emphasis in Risen 2 compared to Piranha Bytes' previous games by incorporating more stat checks into the dialogue system with new talents like Intimidation and Silver Tongue. For the most part, these options allow for alternative solutions to quests or get you extra rewards in the process. 
For example, when trying to infiltrate the pirate camp on Takarigua, you can persuade the gate guard to let you in through the front door using either Silver Tongue or Intimidation, thus taking the shortcut, or if you lack those skills, you can work your way around the map and sneak in from the back. Other quests give you even more options. When getting the cannons from Wilson, you can accomplish this by either hooking him up with the escort Grace or by getting his gun back from Henri. With Grace, you have to pay for her services, but with enough silver tongue, you can cut the price from 1,000 gold to 500 gold. And with Henri, you can steal the gun by sending your pet monkey in through his window, if your thievery skill is high enough and you've learned monkey training, or win it from him by beating him in a shooting gallery minigame. That's effectively three opportunities to use your skills, whether your characters or yours personally, plus a default fourth option if you can't do any of the others, all for a single objective. That might be the most complex quest solution in the game in terms of options, so they're not all like that. Some only have two possible solutions and many only have one, but I think there's enough variety here to provide some basic satisfaction for RPG fans and fans of Piranha Bytes. Splitting the content up into different islands and tying each island to its own centralized main quest and story progression also helps to distribute the game's content more evenly over the total playtime. An issue I've had with later Piranha Bytes games like Risen 3 and Elix, and to a lesser extent Risen 1, is that they tend to front load their content in the first chapter. In those games, if you go around doing everything possible in Chapter 1, then you end up with little to do in subsequent chapters but quickly breeze through the main storytelling quest NPCs, I've already done that. That doesn't really happen in Risen 2. In fact, it's basically impossible to go around clearing the world of all its content without advancing the main quest, because so much of the apparent side content is actually part of the main quest. Although it's possible on certain islands to do most everything you're expected before talking to the main quest NPC to actually advance the main quest, the preliminary tasks in the main quest itself are so tightly interwoven that it all flows together effortlessly and gives the game a good feeling of pacing and momentum as you move from island to island, thus working your way through the game. Each new island you visit is essentially the start of an all-new adventure, and with certain islands not unlocking until later on, there's always a feeling of there being something new out there to explore and discover, all the way up until the very end of the game. Having the world separated into smaller, self-contained islands helps to cut down on some of the wasted space, too, since it keeps each area of the game feeling concise enough that you aren't stuck running across huge, empty spaces to get to the next important area, thus keeping the gameplay focus on the areas that actually matter. This design also gives the game a lot of compelling non-linearity, since the main objective, defeat Mara, is itself split into four sub-goals, obtain the four Titan artifacts on different islands, which you can do in just about any order after obtaining the first one, and then each of those sub-goals splits into a bunch more sub-goals that you're able to pick up and resolve organically just by exploring the world and discovering things for yourself. As such, it rarely ever feels like you're railroaded into a linear script to advance the main story, except for a few specific moments like when you get stranded on the Gnome Island and have to complete the quests there before you can move on to other islands, but even that gives you a variety of objectives to complete in a non-linear order. The main quest line on each island does have one or more convergence points, however. Typically after you've completed the non-linear preliminary objectives, when the story presentation becomes more linear and you're simply expected to follow the finale to its conclusion. In most cases, this involves a more heavily scripted scenario with special cutscenes and unique gameplay scenarios that build the action up to the climax, where you typically face a unique boss encounter or have some kind of epic showdown with the island's antagonist. The new emphasis on cutscenes brings the story to life even more than usual in these games, with much more elaborate character animations tailored for that specific cutscene, plus more cinematic camera angles and camera movements, coupled with what feels like film score music set specifically to the timing and events of that specific scene. The production quality is obviously nowhere near what other, higher budgeted games were doing at the time, so the cutscenes aren't technically all that impressive, but I think they're a nice little addition to bring out a little more excitement and visual clarity to key moments in the storytelling. The first boss encounter, for instance, isn't especially great in terms of gameplay. You basically just walk around easily avoiding attacks, waiting for it to open its mouth or chest or whatever so that you can chuck a magic spear into its exposed innards and repeat that process over and over again until it eventually dies. But then there's an obnoxious quick time event that basically only exists as a gotcha moment to troll the player. It's incredibly simplistic and straightforward, so it makes that first boss pretty underwhelming and unsatisfying from a gameplay perspective, but it still works as an exciting moment in the story because of how the presentation shifts to try to glorify this epic battle with a unique scenario. All the cutscene and character interactions surrounding it, both before and after, build the scenario up even more and help to make this boss battle feel like an appropriate climax for the finale of that first chapter arc, just because of the presentation alone. 
The main story is further aided by some surprisingly decent writing and voice acting. The first game had some impressive English localization going on, and Risen 2 is just as good on that front, with lots of witty dialogue succeeding on offbeat humor and clever wordplay that doesn't always come across very strongly when translating from one language to another. Can I help you? We must gather up the offerings. Kanadiktu. Kanadiktu what? Shaganumbi? I suppose. The voice acting is pretty good, too, with basically every actor doing a serviceable job of bringing these characters to life in spite of some cartoonishly exaggerated accents and animations. Come on, Spence, don't get depressed. Snap out of it, son! As long as you don't start talking to yourself, it'll all be fine. Sorry? Sorry? D did you say something? A conversation like the one with Grace and Antigua isn't very flashy or even all that meaningful, but the writing and voice acting still manage to make it decently interesting and engaging because of the topics they cover and the way the two voice actors play up the pretense of her virtue and exchange witticisms. Drop the act, sweetheart. We both know you're no lady. Only Bongard of the Thorn Coast I ever heard of was a one-eyed pimp who got stabbed to death for cheating at dice. Clever little bastard, aren't you? But a pirate? Why do I get the feeling I'm not the only one here pretending to be something they ain't? It helps, too, that the conversations do a pretty good job of incorporating interesting dialogue choices into the mix, particularly early on, which will lead to branching outcomes that can expand on the lore and world building in different ways or unlock extra gameplay possibilities depending on what you say. This kind of design makes you want to actively pay attention to conversations more and not just passively tune out while listening to the NPCs dump their dialogue out on you. Unlike Risen 1, there aren't any standout, exceptional performances by any of the main cast members, with high-profile talent like John Rhys Davies, Andy Serkis, and Lena Headey gone in favor of presumably cheaper, lesser-known talent. Patty, for instance, has a new voice actor who does an adequate job but doesn't bring the same type of warmth or sincerity to the role that the character had in the first game, thus making her feel slightly more generic in the sequel. You found anyone else on this island you can trust, and you came to this island on your own. So, I'm thinking you didn't find anyone before now. What do I do about this Titan? If it gets free, anything could happen. Well, there's no one else on this island I'd rather have make the decision. Whatever you do, I know it'll be the right thing. Well, I, I was thinking... Thinking what? Doesn't matter. Come on, tell me. That we're good together. You've really helped me. I appreciate it. The only voice that really stood out to me is that of William Roberts, who played Diego in the original Gothic and Vesemir in the Witcher games, though none of the characters he portrays in Risen 2 are all that interesting or memorable. Gods, man, you can't go on sober. Pirates on this crew are drinkers. Go see booze. For the most part, the voice acting is fun and light-hearted and contributes to the game's whimsical pirate tone and atmosphere in a positive way. I love how melodramatically macabre and borderline insane Bones is, for instance, which makes sense of course given that he's a mad doctor whose soul was ripped from his body, leaving him split between life and death. Whatever you do, we all die! You waste your time, except your death comes soon! The only vocal delivery I didn't care for is Jafar. Jafar go on big danger journey for Khan. See world, learn human language more, find Orikaki. I don't mind the other gnomes. In fact, some of them are pretty fun and feel like a good fit for the game. Your name's Nuri, so what's up? But Jafar in particular just sounds so thin and raspy that it's almost like nails on a chalkboard for me, so I would personally have preferred them to do something different with him given that he's a main crew member you'll be interacting with more than the other gnomes. Besides Jafar, he recruits several other crew members to man your ship as well. These characters act as persistent party members that you can bring with you on most of your adventures to act as an extra weapon or meat shield in combat, and they also occasionally chime in with extra bits of dialogue with NPCs. But maybe not ever, he's spoken for. I am? I mean... I am. Some of them even have some kind of unique special ability. For instance, Chani can heal you with magic, Hawkins allegedly boosts combat strength of all party members, Jafar can collect loot for you, and so on. This is one of those areas where the Bioware influence feels pretty strong, but unfortunately the whole crew member system feels barely thought out and not implemented very well. 
Unlike in a Bioware game, or for that matter, a Black Isle or Obsidian game, your crew members don't have any kind of progressive character development where you build a relationship with them, which will lead towards some kind of personal quest or mechanical benefit that will unlock once you gain their complete trust or whatever. You can ask some party members what they think about you, which suggests there might have been some kind of attempt at a relationship meter, but there's no stat to keep track of this information and their responses don't seem to have any strong correlation with anything. See for example how Patty says the exact same thing at the very beginning of the game when you're just starting out on your adventure together, and much, much later when your bond should be at or near maximum. I should also mention that Patty is the only crew member who gets any kind of meaningful personal quest, but it's locked behind the Treasure Isle DLC. It's not even part of the main game. The other crew members just get a minor quest to recruit them to your ship, but even then, most are just kind of given to you as a result of the main quest, and then they just kind of stand around on the ship the whole game not really doing anything. A character like Jafar, for example, is specifically set up to have a personal quest, but then nothing ever comes of it. The whole reason he joins you at all is to find something to serve as his Ori Kolki, an item of special value that all gnomes strive to find as some kind of rite of passage, but you never actually do anything to help him find it. At the end of the game, he just decides he wants something you already obtained as part of the main quest, and then you just give it to him. It's like they set up this plot point and did absolutely nothing with it, only to rush out a conclusion in the very end of the game, literally minutes before the credits roll. Some of them make random comments about the new island you're on or the state of the main quest, but these comments are always so incredibly minor, and oftentimes not really motivated by anything, that they come off feeling incidental and out of place a lot of the time. Near the end of the game, for instance, Chani gives some kind of heartfelt speech about how she was wrong to doubt your abilities when she first joined you and how you're such a good leader and have opened her eyes to the greater world outside of her tribe, and so on. That's exactly the kind of conversation that should be happening near the end of a character's development, except there aren't similar character moments along the way that build towards this resolution by showing that progressive change. You do have conversations with each other, but nothing really along those lines. I haven't tested this, but I'm pretty sure you could ignore her completely after she joins your crew by never talking to her and never bringing her with you onto any of the islands, and she'd still give you that same little speech if you talk to her near the end of the game, because I suspect she's programmed to just deliver that line at that stage of the main quest. That may not be the actual case, but that's certainly how it feels, which means that reaction doesn't feel earned, in other words, because it doesn't seem to derive from any direct interaction you had with her through some kind of mechanical system, whether it be building an affinity meter or fulfilling some kind of personal quest to justify that reaction. So it's like Piranha Bytes knew that party members are supposed to go through some kind of growth and progression in this type of game system, but then never implemented the actual gameplay systems to effect that growth and progression. Another area in which the party member system falls flat is in the finale, where you take your crew to confront the final boss. Typically in these sorts of games, like say with Mass Effect 2, the crew you assemble plays some kind of important role in the final battle. Like if you've boosted a party member's relationship meter to max, they'll make a certain part of the final mission easier, or they'll have some special moment in a cutscene where they contribute some kind of special ability to the situation, or you'll have to choose who you bring with you and that affects how the end scenario plays out, and so on. Even in Gothic 2, which doesn't feature a traditional party member system with social stats and party bonuses or whatever, the crew you bring with you to Erdorath plays an important role in how the final chapter plays out, with certain characters providing unique assistance throughout the final dungeon and basically everyone serving as some kind of valuable skill trainer or merchant, in addition to contributing extra dialogue to further expand on the things you encounter throughout the dungeon. Risen 2 does nothing of the sort. For the final chapter, everyone mysteriously vanishes off screen while you single-handedly fight the Kraken, and then your party members are forcibly removed from your party for no apparent reason when you enter the fight against Mara. Their only involvement in the game's climax is jumping into a horribly designed clusterfuck of enemies waiting for you on a tiny, narrow dock at Mara's hideout, and then everyone goes right back to standing around doing nothing. You can go around talking to each one before and after the fight with Mara for a short line of encouragement, but some of these crew members never really signed up to fight Mara and have no personal investment in helping you out or saving the world, which makes a lot of these sentiments at the end of the game feel artificially forced. In effect, they don't contribute anything of substantial value to the gameplay or story when it comes to resolving the main quest, and as such, they may as well not even be there. Although I've praised the story in general as being Risen 2's strongest asset, there's one moment in particular that I want to bring up, where they just completely dropped the ball and ruined what could have been the most interesting quest of the game, thereby lowering the overall quality of the storytelling. 
I'm going to have to spoil one of the major quest arcs to explain how they accomplished this, so if you're trying to avoid spoilers then skip ahead in the video, but know that there's one major screw-up so bad that it was able to single-handedly tarnish the one bit of major praise I actually have for Risen 2. The quest in question is the Greedy Captain, which involves tracking down the pirate Captain Garcia and his Titan artifact in Maracay Bay, where the Inquisition, headed by Commandant Corrientes, is on expedition. The whole premise of the quest is that Garcia and Corrientes are there with competitive interests, but both men have headed into the uncharted jungle, so in order to find Garcia, you need to follow a trail of clues to find Corrientes and work with him to resolve problems he's been having with Garcia's crew in the hopes of eventually finding Garcia himself. Except, it turns out, the man you think is Corrientes has been Garcia all along, posing as Corrientes after killing him and taking his uniform. And by helping him deal with the alleged pirates, you've actually been helping the bad guy cover up his tracks and tie up nefarious loose ends at the Inquisition's expense. It's a great twist because the hints are definitely there that these Inquisition guys aren't actually with the Inquisition, and if you're really paying attention and thinking about things then you might be able to see through the disguise, but the hints are just subtle enough that you're unlikely to put everything together until it's time for the game's dramatic reveal. At which point it immediately ratchets up the stakes and dramatic intrigue as you realize, oh crap, what have I done, and then have to rush to stop Garcia from getting away with his conniving ruse. The quest completely falls apart, however, if you manage to deduce Garcia's hidden identity before the game intends for it to be revealed, whether that be through your own logical deductions outside of the game or through in-game means by solving certain quests in certain ways, at which point your character will also learn of Garcia's hidden identity, because it basically breaks the main quest line and prevents you from seeing any of the exciting climax or resolution, and prevents you from doing anything sane or logical to solve the problem. If you don't learn Garcia's identity, then the main quest continues on as normal where you help Corrientes gain access to the Fire Temple or whatever, only for him to double-cross you and set off for the temple himself, thus setting up a special scenario where you have to pass through the Wall of Fire and fight your way to Garcia, where you're treated to the traditional hero versus villain dialogue scene before the final confrontation, which itself presents a more epic and exciting battle under special circumstances, complete with cinematic cutscenes and a special appearance by Mara. If you do learn Garcia's identity, then the quest skips all of that and as you confront Garcia and all of his men all at once in the village where all the Marakai natives also become hostile and attack you as well. There's not even an optional quest branch to provide proof to the Marakai chieftain that Corrientes isn't who he says he is, he just shuts you down and refuses to listen. So by diligently uncovering the truth, you're actually punished with a much harder and less interesting fight and miss out on all the important storytelling stuff with Garcia and Mara in the temple. Meanwhile, the fight starts you out in a tiny enclosed room where you get completely wrecked if you try to take those guys head on, and get wrecked if you run out into the open where even more guys can start shooting at you. The only way I was able to win that fight was to use Voodoo to turn Garcia's guys aggressive towards one another, and then swoop in for the kill at the last moment, which doesn't make any sense either because no one else around them seems to realize that, hey, these guys are fighting for no good reason, or that, hey, this guy casting obvious Voodoo magic might be the one starting these fights, and Garcia never realizes that his crew around him is slowly dying off one by one. There really should have been an option for you to play along with Garcia's plans, even once you've uncovered his identity, so you can get him out of the village to fight him one-on-one, -on -one, or at least away from so many other people, and so that you don't miss out on all that important story stuff with him and Mara in the temple. In fact, that stuff at the temple with Garcia and Mara seems so absolutely essential to the quest's climax and resolution that confronting Garcia in his hut shouldn't even be an option. The hero should just say to himself, no use fighting him here, I should play along with his plan so I can get him away from the village, thus ensuring that you'll actually be able to see the quest's climax. As it is, it's just mind-bogglingly insane that they force you into a horribly suboptimal resolution to that quest line for doing what should be considered the right thing, and it's especially frustrating because of how impressive that twist actually was, only for the game to completely ruin it with everything that comes afterward. While I'm in spoiler territory, I also need to talk about how underwhelming the finale is. The final boss fight is comprised of two parts, one against the Kraken and one against Mara, and both fights are simplified rehashes of boss battles you've already fought previously. The Kraken is basically just the Earth Titan all over again, except without the first phase of battling Crow and his henchmen, and Mara plays out like a one-on-one -on -one sword duel against a regular humanoid opponent, except with maybe a few pesky sand devils thrown into the mix, exactly like the fight with Garcia. 
For whatever reason, Mara is actually even easier than Garcia, because she doesn't have an unblockable, undodgeable pistol attack like Garcia, and it seems random whether she'll summon the Sand Devils to bother you or not, so there's a good chance you might never have to deal with those either. Furthermore, if you sided with the natives and use a Voodoo Curse doll on her, you can actually kill Mara in just two hits. And unlike Gothic 1, Gothic 2, or Risen 1, there's no final dungeon whatsoever to give a proper build-up or escalation to the final boss. The Water Temple, where Mara has her secret headquarters, is just an empty corridor leading up to the final boss chamber. So once you discover where to confront Mara, you're quickly thrust through a series of cutscenes where you fight the Kraken, arrive at the Water Temple, and defeat Mara in the span of 15 minutes or less, which is pretty anticlimactic and unfulfilling, especially in contrast with all the dramatic buildup in the other main quest arcs to acquire the four Titan artifacts. Like I said earlier, the appeal of Piranha Bytes games isn't usually the story or the characters, but rather the world and gameplay, and it's here where Risen 2 really drops the ball. Even though I praise the world design for integrating so well with the main quest line, it's not very satisfying or rewarding to actually explore on its own. The whole world feels incredibly compartmentalized into smaller, enclosed areas and more linear paths where there's always some kind of border around you, thus turning exploration into a matter of sequentially checking off areas as you move from area to area across the map. And with the removal of freeform climbing, swimming, and diving systems, you're forcibly landlocked into a two-dimensional plane of exploration, such that you basically just follow the ground ahead of you at all times in a straightforward manner, adhering to the areas that are explicitly defined by the map. What's worse is that the game does a poor job of rewarding exploration with tangible discoveries. Typically in Piranha Bytes games, you're encouraged to explore discrete areas like behind dense foliage or around corners or over high ledges because you'll find some kind of reward, whether it be a simple potion or spell scroll or a unique weapon or a fun easter egg or a bit of environmental storytelling. Most of the time in Risen 2, going that extra step to check for hidden secrets usually rewards you with dead ends and empty spaces, which is pretty unsatisfying in and of itself, but also further discourages you from exploring anywhere beyond the obvious areas of the map that you're clearly intended to explore. Take those obvious stair-step looking ledges, for example, which serve as the only surfaces you can actually climb in the game. I think those are supposed to be little hidden areas that you're meant to go out of your way to explore, but the restrictive climbing system telegraphs these hidden areas in such a blatantly obvious way that they're not satisfying to discover, and thus the rewards you find at the end of them don't feel earned. Ancient temples make a return from Risen 1, except they're nowhere near as big or complex, and the temples in Risen 1 weren't that big or complex to begin with, compared to the dungeons in Gothic 1 and 2, which makes Risen 2's temples even more shallow and disappointing in comparison. Every single one amounts to a couple of square rooms and rectangular hallways strung together in a repetitive, cookie-cutter pattern, and they all consist of the exact same gameplay scenario of move the idols from one altar to another to open doors and press space to dodge traps. They are all practically interchangeable. There's always valuable treasure to find within these temples, but the temples themselves are so simple and straightforward that they're neither fun nor satisfying to complete. I criticized the temples in Risen 1 for getting repetitive in the second half of that game, but at least they had unique layouts with some sense of progression and a little more variety in the puzzles and encounters, unlike the ones in Risen 2. I'd also like to point out that there's a lack of variety in the environments which makes them even less interesting to explore. Despite having a half dozen islands that you can visit over the course of the game, basically every single one has the same tropical jungle aesthetic and so it gets to feel pretty repetitive over time, when it seems like they should have strived to give each island its own unique look and atmosphere. Obviously it makes realistic sense for them all to be tropical jungles given the setting, but it still seems like they could have given more distinguishing looks and atmospheres for each island. Maybe one could have been volcanic and partially charred out by a previous eruption, or one could have been a bunch of shallow shoals with water and coral everywhere, or one could have been a massive crystalline cave system, or another one could have had a lot of tall, rocky cliffs, and so on. As it is, Takarigua, Antigua, the Sword Coast, and Marakai Bay all have varying combinations of jungle wilderness, native villages and temples, inquisition outposts, and pirate towns, so there's an extreme amount of overlap between those four islands. The Isle of Thieves at least has the Gnome Village, which is itself somewhat unique, but that's a relatively small area on a relatively small island that otherwise blends in with the rest of the bland jungle wilderness aesthetic that you see everywhere else. So really, the only unique islands in the game are Caldera, which consists entirely of a single block of modern cityscape, and the Isle of the Dead, which is like a dusty ghost town with MC Escher-esque architecture. 
There are some interesting attempts to create unique tones and atmospheres on Treasure Isle and Storm Island, but since these are DLC islands that are seemingly cut from the game to be sold at extra cost, it's hard to give them positive credit for much of anything in light of the negative impact their business models have on the consumer. Even within individual islands, there's not much in the way of distinct landmarks or notable structure to help with navigation, as you see the same repeated assets everywhere you look, and so a lot of areas end up looking kind of generic and samey. In Marakai Bay, I found myself constantly having to check the map everywhere I went because I kept making wrong turns into the wrong areas, because everything looked so similar all around me that I couldn't keep track of which path led where or how the different areas were spatially related to one another. The contextual design of some of these islands doesn't even make sense when you stop to think about it, which really starts to detract from the game's sense of society. The Crystal Fortress at Caldera, for instance, is said to be the headquarters of the Inquisition, but it's just a tiny little fort with only one parapet and only one dock. That seems woefully inadequate to defend the city from a naval assault or to facilitate their supposed fleet of ships, which they allegedly had before Mara started sinking them all. I mean, the pirate town on Antigua has more docks to support more ships coming and going than the freaking headquarters of the world's largest military organization. In fact, every single civilized hub in this game feels tiny in scale, both in terms of the landmass dedicated to it and the amount of people living there, which makes it a little hard to believe some of these locations being real, functional places. If you were to combine the Inquisition ports of Sacarico, Isabella, and Caldera into one location, they'd still be smaller than Gothic 2's Harbor Town or the old camp from Gothic 1, both of which operated in a much more tangibly presented manner than anything in Risen 2. Even the Harbor Town in Risen 1, which always felt somewhat modest in comparison to the Gothic games, is a massive city compared to anything in Risen 2. Puerto Isabella is the worst offender, as its nonsensical design extends from the physical composition to its characters and quest dialogue as well. For starters, there are only five beds in the entire garrison to support the dozens of soldiers stationed there. Where do all these people sleep, and why isn't the garrison big enough to house all these soldiers? Why is there even a garrison there at all? The Sword Coast consists entirely of wilderness and a dozen or so native Shaganumbi, so what's the strategic benefit of setting up a garrison in this particular area? Is the whole purpose of this Inquisition port just for the sake of maintaining a storage house for all the goods they supposedly trade? And who are they even trading with this far south of the continent to need a storehouse set up here? Why are the port-facing cannons loaded with cannonballs and gunpowder for just anyone to come along and impulsively fire? Why does no one care when you're actively shooting up the Inquisition ship and its crew with cannon fire? Why is there a lit fuse on a bomb in the storehouse that never seems to detonate? When you free Hawkins from prison, he says he's going to a cave to hide, and then he just stands out in plain sight of the road and main entrance to town where any random passers-by could easily spot him. Even the main gate guard could spot him if he just took a few steps forward and turned slightly. Martina says that no one knows where the Jaguar's lair is except for him, and then it turns out the lair is a cave literally right outside of town, the first thing you encounter when heading out of town that way. Shouldn't it have been pretty easy to find that cave and deduce that a Jaguar was making its lair there? Renaka wants meat before he'll talk to you, but even though you've got tons of cooked chicken and pork, you have to go spend 100 gold on special quest meat from the butcher. People are psychically aware that there's a player-controlled monkey on the second floor of the warehouse when it climbed in through a window that no one could see, and everyone becomes psychically aware that you stole something from someone's house the moment a random worker sees you. Sebastiano gets irate at you for working with the pirates when that was the whole point of your mission in the first place, and he was one of two men who were both aware of and on board with this plan. He also tells you that swords are made from copper because someone made a typo in the script and didn't notice during voice recording. He should be saying that swords are made by Cooper, who's the town blacksmith, because at that moment in the conversation he's also talking about other service providers in town in the same context, and it doesn't even make sense to make swords from copper to begin with because it's such a soft metal that would not work well on a sword, and copper is not a crafting material in the game anyway. There's just so much crazy nonsense going on in Puerto Isabella that it lost all plausibility to me and even managed to call the greater world building into question. Further hindering the game's sense of society is the fact that you never actually join a faction in Risen 2. The typical Piranha Bytes formula involves joining a faction as some kind of novice and progressively working your way up to the higher ranks, thereby unlocking more powerful equipment and gameplay altering abilities while also giving you a stronger feeling of belonging within the world, which will shape your character's perspective on the story. Instead of joining a faction in Risen 2, you enlist the aid of a faction to help you infiltrate the Earth Temple so that you can fight Crow and get his Titan artifact. 
That decision dictates the skill path your character will take, with you either learning how to shoot muskets or perform voodoo magic, but once that's accomplished, your relationship with your chosen faction basically stops. It is, essentially, a one-time partnership where you unlock access to all or most of the available skill trainers for that faction, and then you go your separate ways. Every now and then you run into a quest with a branching solution depending on which faction you chose previously. For instance, when trying to get into the High Council building on Caldera, you can either pose as Maragato's messenger if you sided with the Inquisition, or you can possess Maragato and go there yourself as Maragato if you learned voodoo magic. But this usually amounts to only one quest per island, which only lasts a few minutes. In that sense, faction selection doesn't really matter because you're going to be an independent pirate captain the whole game, solving most quests with little regard for your faction selection. Despite knowing voodoo magic, I never really got to feel like a voodoo shaman in Risen 2 and was immensely disappointed once I realized I was never going to unlock voodoo shaman armor, since the only armor sets in the game are faction neutral pirate clothing. The two faction choices aren't particularly fun gameplay options in my opinion either. With muskets, gameplay amounts to a basic point-and-click ordeal where you safely shoot enemies from a distance until they die, while running around passively waiting for the weapon's cooldown, i.e. reload, to refresh, without any of the fun nuance that comes from third-person shooters like rewarding precise aim, or requiring the strategic use of cover sources, or having you actively dodge enemy projectiles, or frantically move about the arena setting yourself up for good shots or whatever. It really is just click until they die. The targeting radius for muskets and shotguns is generously wide, and the ability to land critical hits seems entirely up to random chance, so there's not much skill required to do well with guns, and thus I don't find it particularly fun, engaging, or rewarding. It was actually a little frustrating at times, because there's a persistent bug with reloading and redrawing your weapon which causes you to move forward while holding down the S key, so if you're turning to sprint away from an enemy and then turning back to draw your aim on them again, you find yourself walking toward them instead of away from them like you should be. It happens every single time you do that, and so I ran into it all the time and basically had to train myself to work around it, lest I inadvertently walk straight into an attack. Voodoo would seem to be a more interesting option, but it basically amounts to crowd control spells and passive debuffs, which aren't very fun either. As a voodoo pirate, you get access to a mere four magic abilities in combat. A fear spell that temporarily stuns an opponent, but only lasts for one hit before they're immediately back in action attacking you again, so it's really only useful for removing an extra opponent from a group fight. A confuse or enrage spell that makes two enemy targets fight each other, where you don't get the credit for defeated enemies unless you land the killing blow, and where the affected enemies can still turn their attention to you if you damage them too much, in which case the most effective option is to patiently stand there waiting for them to duke it out until one of them gets low on health so you can swoop in for the kill. A summon ghost spell that creates another party member over whom you have no direct control as they just run around doing their own thing under the guidance of the game's generally inept AI. And curse dolls that massively debuff enemies' health and damage values, which is only worth using on bosses and other tougher single enemy encounters because curse dolls are limited by somewhat rare crafting materials. None of them deal direct offense, so you're stuck relying on some other means, namely the shoddy melee combat system, to actually deal damage. So if you're someone who enjoys playing as a pure mage in these games, then that option is basically gone. It turns out a lot of enemies also happen to be immune to different types of voodoo, or else require a certain talent level to actually cast magic on them. So you run into somewhat frequent instances when your magic just doesn't even work. Even when you meet the minimum stat requirements, some spells just seem to randomly fail, and I don't know if that's some kind of intentional design or just a random glitch that happens semi-regularly. I chose to learn Voodoo in my playthrough, because even though I knew the magic system wouldn't play anything like a traditional mage, I figured it would at least be more interesting than just repetitively clicking on enemies until they die like the gameplay is with guns. I quickly grew to regret that decision, however, because the magic system proved generally ineffective and not very fun. I reluctantly found myself having to put points into pistols and swords just to be able to fight stuff, and after reaching a certain point with those skills, I basically stopped using magic because it was quicker and more straightforward to just shoot and slash enemies to death instead of fumbling around with crazy slow casting animations just to temporarily stun or confuse an enemy I was going to be killing quickly anyway. The gunplay isn't particularly fun or engaging compared to combat systems and other action RPGs, but compared to the voodoo magic, it's at least effective and involves a little more active gameplay, though it comes with the expense of basically nullifying the difficulty. 
combat is a huge mess overall, in fact, which is a real shame because there's some interesting aspects to it that are unfortunately in service of a really unsatisfying system. There's a surprising amount of variety in your offensive options since you have the whole arsenal of dirty tricks at your disposal, which includes things like throwing sand or coconuts at your enemies or sicking a parrot on them, plus other things like pistols, bombs, throwing knives, throwing spears, curved swords, straight swords, and shotguns, in addition to faction-specific muskets and voodoo magic. That alone gives you a lot of options for character building and figuring out what playstyle is the most fun for you personally, and they also help to tie the pirate theme into the combat system more strongly. They also tried to give more interesting tactics to the enemies so that fights against different enemies would feel a little more unique and require a slightly different approach. They all behave a little differently, with wild boars doing a barreling charge attack on you, monkeys circling around you and throwing coconuts at you, crabs hunkering down behind their shells and claws needing to be kicked over to expose their soft underbelly, jaguars pouncing on you and triggering a quick time event, termites hanging back and shooting ranged goo at you, and so on. Even the fights against human opponents can be different depending on whether you're fighting Inquisition guards, pirates, or native tribesmen, since they use different types of weaponry and have wildly different combat animations in some cases. So those are good things where the combat showed promise, but again, it's all in service of a really unsatisfying system. For whatever reason, Piranha Bytes decided to do away with the melee system from Risen 1, which was decently functional and just needed some tweaking of the timing and animations to make it really work its best, and came up with an all new system for Risen 2. I think the idea was to recreate the feeling of swashbuckling pirate duels instead of the more medieval fighting style of Risen 1, which they've reinforced with new features like Dirty Tricks, but I never found them to be all that useful, even with my Dirty Tricks talent boosted to a respectable amount. Salt and Sand are just like the Fear spell, where they temporarily stun an opponent but it only lasts for one hit, and despite the fact that it leaves a blinded message over the enemy, it doesn't seem to affect their accuracy or damage at all. Coconuts do so little damage and have such limited availability that you're better off just relying on pistols. The Parrot skill requires a really high cunning level to unlock, and by that point it's kind of useless. And the Fire Oil, I don't even know what that does, because it doesn't seem to do anything at all. As for the actual sword play, it's hard to pin down what exactly is wrong with it, but the whole thing feels unresponsive and unsatisfying. I guess it starts with the animations, which are pretty stiff and awkwardly root you to the ground while attacking, but there's no feeling of flow or rhythm to the attacks. Unlike Risen 1, there's no combo system where you have to time your attacks at the right moment to execute the combo faster, and there's no definitive start and end to an attack sequence, with like a mechanically distinguished finisher signifying the end of the combo, followed by a slight pause before you can start the attack sequence again. Instead, it's just an incessant stream of three disjointed hacking chops where you can furiously mash on the attack button and the character will just keep attacking indefinitely. Without a distinguished combo system or timing system, and with only having one type of attack, it gives the feeling like you don't have a lot of direct control over how you're going to attack, like your only control is to turn the attack animations on or off. The targeting system doesn't help either, because you don't have much direct control over it. Your character only directly focuses on enemies while holding down right click to put you in guard stance, but you don't always want to be guarding because that lowers your movement speed to a snail's pace, and when you attack you stop specifically locking onto that target, so it's easy to have the targeting system inadvertently lead you towards unintended enemies or even cause you to whiff completely in the wrong direction. It's not a big deal because with enough practice you can direct attack somewhat reliably, but it still allows extra room for error when it seems like you should have more direct control over the lock-on system instead of being passively reliant on the game doing it for you. Avoiding attacks is pretty awkward too. In fact, there wasn't even a dodge function when the game first launched, and you were also incapable of blocking monster attacks, so you had basically zero defensive capabilities before these features got patched in several weeks later. I remember certain enemies were just a frustrating nightmare to fight because you simply could not avoid certain types of attacks. So the patched in dodge maneuver and the ability to block monster attacks helps to make the combat a little more functional, but they definitely feel tacked on and not really part of the fundamental system. Being able to block all animal attacks with a sword is a little weird for instance because I'm not really sure how that works in practical terms, and it makes defense a little too easy when you can just hold right click down indefinitely and not take any damage, while the dodge maneuver doesn't give you any sort of invulnerability during the dodge so you're constantly taking damage while dodging, thereby making it less useful than it would seem to be. 
you can't even use it to generate offense. In similar games, you'd be able to use good reflexes to dodge an enemy attack while putting yourself in position to attack their exposed flank, but such strategies don't work in Risen 2 because the roll dodge moves you so far out of position that you can never be in a good spot to attack back. There also seems to be an unfair imbalance in the way hit stun works, with enemies being able to interrupt your actions far more easily than you can interrupt theirs, which is especially problematic against humanoid enemies who are in a perpetual state of either guarding or attacking. When a human opponent is guarding, they're completely impervious to all sword damage, and that's the stance they default to when they're not attacking. So your only opportunity to damage them is while they're attacking, where you become susceptible to taking damage and where their attacks seem to get priority and frequently interrupt yours. This leads to a lot of frustrating moments where you're basically just standing around waiting for an enemy to lower their guard, and then you try to get an attack and once you see an opening, only to have your attack get interrupted. Or else you're stuck guessing and clicking the attack button at random intervals, hoping that through random luck you'll start an attack a split second before they do, so that you can actually hit them while their guard is down and not get hit yourself. This is where things like the dirty tricks are supposed to come in handy, but again, their effects only last for a single hit, if the effect even lands at all, and then you're stuck waiting in a cooldown period to use it again. So at its most basic level, the sword combat just feels like a random click fest where you can't really do anything productive within the system, and so there's no satisfaction to be derived from learning good timing or tactics or making good reactions so that you can best your enemies. In fairness, the system improves a little when you start investing points into sword combat, sort of like it does with Gothic and Risen 1, as you unlock extra abilities like kicks, stagger, parries, reposts, and power attacks. These extra abilities give you a little extra proactive control over the fight, and in some cases are necessary to be able to actually do anything productive, but they don't really solve the core issues of the clunky combat system, and in fact they even introduce some all new problems of their own. The kick ability, for instance, seems like it would be useful for breaking an opponent's guard so that you can get a quick hit or two in, but you have a somewhat long recovery period after that animation, and it also knocks the enemy back far enough that it's rare for you to ever successfully land a follow-up attack. It's useful for knocking crabs over, and maybe for interrupting certain types of telegraphed attacks, but that's about all it's consistently good for. Parries and reposts, meanwhile, only work against sword-wielding humanoid opponents, so they do zero good against monsters or other wild animals, which is probably what you spend the majority of your time fighting. That leaves the power attack as the only sword ability that's universally viable, thanks to its stagger ability giving you an edge in that department, but it's sort of just random luck whether it'll hit or not. So your best options are to constantly queue up power attacks and hope for the best, or sit around passively waiting for the opponent to attack so that you can parry and repost them. The real problem with these more advanced abilities is that they all have overlapping controls that perform different actions under slightly different circumstances, which creates a lot of opportunity for your character to do randomly different things than you intended if the timing or circumstances aren't exactly right. Left click, for example, is used for both attack and parry, and pressing the spacebar will either perform a dodge, kick, or jump depending on whether you're standing still or moving and whether you have your guard up, and is also involved with reposting. To perform a repost, you have to be holding down right click to be in a guard stance as if to block, and then left click when the enemy is about to hit, and then immediately press space to initiate the counterattack. In this case, performing a single action requires the combined use of three different buttons where five different functions can all occur, depending on the exact timing of actions and what all else is going on in the fight. If the timing is off even slightly, then you wind up with two or more queued actions that are different from what you intended. This is a big part of why the combat feels unresponsive, because the game doesn't give you a lot of effective options for offense and defense in the first place, and when it does, the controls are convoluted and have a lot of potential for inconsistent and unexpected results. These extra abilities and stat boosts from skills make the combat easier as you level up, but it doesn't necessarily make it any better. In practice, you're only adding a couple extra abilities to a fundamentally flawed system and then passively boosting damage values, so even though it gets less frustrating, it doesn't get any more fun. It's a far cry from Gothic 1 and 2 where the animations changed completely to become more fluid and responsive, or even Risen 1 where you had 10 levels of sword mastery that progressively unlocked new active and passive abilities with each new level. 
It doesn't help that Risen 2 isn't very clear about why you might be struggling with the combat early on or what exactly will make things easier. Gothic 1, for example, made it painfully obvious that your unskilled combat training animations were so rubbish that you shouldn't even bother trying to do any serious amount of fighting until learning some skills, and numerous characters would straight up tell you to not even try certain challenges. Risen 2, like Risen 1, makes you appear to be a decently competent fighter right off the bat, and its action-based mechanics give you the impression that you can do better in fights if you can just learn how everything works and master the systems. But the systems themselves are so disjointed and inconsistent that I don't think there's much room to improve through skill alone. There's something to be said about being hardcore or whatever and having strong RPG mechanics affecting the outcome of combat, but when the core action gameplay feels so janky it's hard to derive any real satisfaction from it. Most of the time I was doing well early on, it felt like I was just exploiting the game mechanics in some kind of unintended and unintuitive, unimmersive, game-breaking kind of way to simply bypass the actual combat system such as by simply avoiding the melee combat altogether and waiting for the pistol to reload, or by circling enemies waiting for that one thrust attack that I can reliably sidestep and actually get a free hit in afterwards, or waiting for that one really long spinny attack so that I can get one free hit in and then go back to patiently waiting for the next long spinny attack. To be clear, bad combat mechanics would be somewhat permissible if this were an immersive sim like Deus Ex or System Shock or Prey 2017 where you're given multiple options to solve objectives and have freedom to craft your own gameplay style, where combat might take more of a backseat role to other possibilities, but a large part of Piranha Bytes' formula revolves around combat. Many quests can only be solved through combat, and you're expected, if not required, to kill pretty much anything and everything that moves to get enough experience and loot necessary to level up. So it's not just that the combat is clunky or frustrating, it's that the game puts a lot of focus on it while also being clunky and frustrating. I should mention that I chose to play on hard difficulty, because I usually find that to be a more rewarding experience in these types of games by making resource management for things like healing potions or spell scrolls more meaningful and consequential, while encouraging you to think outside the box or work harder to overcome more difficult obstacles. In the case of Risen 2, I wouldn't recommend that to anyone else, because I don't think it made the combat any more satisfying, and in fact probably just made it even more frustrating by further highlighting how disjointed so many of the game's mechanical systems actually are. Ultimately, I think this is a game that you play primarily for the story and the atmosphere, not the gameplay, so if you're going to play Risen 2, I think you may as well play on easy mode so that you can at least appreciate those aspects while not having to deal with the clunky frustration of the gameplay so badly. These problems with the combat and difficulty are compounded by the game teaching some misleading and self-conflicting lessons about how everything works and what your priorities should be. You'd expect a game of this sort to start things off at their most difficult, since you're a low-level player with zero experience and only basic combat abilities, but the early stages are actually surprisingly easy, even on the hardest difficulty, because they give you an overpowered companion character who can escort you through every area and every encounter on the first island. And if you ever really struggle with a fight, you can always load up on healing potions and bullets to cheese your way through the fight, or find some other skillful or clever way around it. Meanwhile, you encounter a lot of skill checks for optional bits of content like restricted areas and temple ruins, dialogue options, quest solutions, locked doors and chests, and so on, that are restricted behind hard skill checks that require a certain skill value to access. So the first island effectively teaches you two things. One, that you don't need to invest in combat skills to get by in the game, because you can defeat every enemy with relative ease and zero combat training, all because of your trusty companion character, who's seemingly part of your crew, whom you'll be getting more of later in the game. And two, that if you want to get the most out of the game, you should focus on cunning skills so that you don't miss out on so much optional content. If you go that route like I did, then the game immediately pulls a rug out from under you on the very next island, when it takes your companion character away and leaves you completely bereft of skill trainers to learn combat skills that you'd been previously avoiding. So all of a sudden you're stuck on a brand new, unexplored island all by yourself with zero combat training and no opportunity to correct or make up for your apparent mistake. You're forced at that point to brute force your way through the rest of the island exploring and completing quests until you can side with either the Inquisition or the natives before anyone will teach you anything on the island. And if you side with the natives, like I did, then no one will teach you how to fight with a sword or pistol, because they only know how to teach you voodoo and throwing weapons. 
As I've described previously, the voodoo magic is not sufficient to fight enemies by itself, as it is explicitly meant to serve a complementary role to some other form of damage dealing, but of course the game doesn't teach you that until after you've already joined the natives and committed to voodoo magic, because unlike Gothic or Risen 1, you can't use spell scrolls to sample the magic systems before making a choice, and throwing weapons are insanely underpowered because they do such poor damage and are heavily limited by supply, while also being really expensive to reset stock. Meanwhile, the Inquisition who would know how to teach you more viable forms of combat training won't teach you anything because you sided with the natives, and there are no neutral pirates on the island who can teach you these things either. So I was effectively tricked into doing the entire second island, which might be the biggest one in terms of landmass, enemies, and content, with no companion and no combat training, which made a lot of the combat on that island unnecessarily difficult and exceedingly frustrating. To be fair, I'm at least partially responsible for some of that frustration because it was my choice to ignore combat training on the first island, but in my defense you don't need combat training on the first island. The problem is that, by the time I felt like I needed to start investing in combat training, the option was inexplicably and unexpectedly taken away from me for no good reason really. The way I see it, Steelbeard's crew should have been available to you as skill trainers on the second island for all or most of the skills you had access to on the previous island so that you didn't get completely screwed out of viable options for the entire island like I did. To be clear, this isn't an issue that will affect everyone universally, as it's sort of unique to my personal experience and the choices I made, but the whole situation was enabled by what I would consider to be bad game design. I really just can't wrap my brain around why they would take options away from you like that. I mean, it's not like it was a special moment in the story where you've been captured or shipwrecked or something, the whole point of which is you're now bereft of your usual means and have to improvise with what's available. You're just casually exploring a new island as an extension of the main quest. There's no reason you can't take the rowboat back to the ship to learn from Steelbeard's crew, and there's no pressing reason you can't just sail back to Takarigua. So it really feels like an oversight of omission, like they just did not account for the possibility of someone needing to learn skills they might not have learned on Takarigua. In a change from previous Piranha Bytes games, experience points no longer count towards conventional level ups, and thus you don't gain skill points to spend directly increasing your stats or learning new skills. Instead, experience points, or glory as they're called in Risen 2, are spent directly from the character screen in increasing amounts to improve your attributes, which act as requirements to learn new skills from trainers, while also increasing your talents, which act like passive stats governing your efficacy in various feats and endeavors, ranging from sword combat to ranged combat to thieving and voodoo and so on. I like this system in theory because it adds an extra layer of strategic decision making to the gameplay in terms of how you allocate limited resources. With higher level attributes costing increasing amounts of glory, you run into situations where you have to decide if it's worth it to spend, say, 8000 glory to increase one of your primary attributes or if it's better to distribute those points among multiple lower level attributes instead. It's a near constant balancing act between short term gains and long term planning, like whether it's worth it to handicap yourself for the immediate future by stockpiling glory to dump into a more powerful ability later on, or spending glory that you already have so that you can gain immediate benefit from it at the expense of delaying those higher level attributes and abilities even longer. Couple that with the game's insanely restrictive economy where skills cost an absurd amount of money to learn from trainers and it makes you really think about each decision, weighing the potential benefits of each specific skill you can learn and when you should be investing your limited resources into those attributes and skills to yield the most effective outcome. This is especially applicable in the beginning when resources are extremely limited and you have the whole spectrum of skills yet to learn, thus making each decision feel more consequential and impactful. Unfortunately, this aspect of the progression system runs out of steam somewhat quickly once you start overcoming the money restrictions, and the whole system likewise proves to be more shallow than it would readily seem, thereby making the skill investments in the second half of the game feel far less impactful. For every attribute, about half of the total skills you can learn are just passive modifiers that boost your talents, and a lot of general skills seem to have limited viability or are otherwise completely useless. The entire toughness attribute is of questionable value to me as far as I'm concerned, because the bulk of those skills deal with increasing your maximum health and defenses to increase your survivability in combat. But that whole endeavor is rendered moot by the fact that there are zero restrictions preventing you from spamming healing potions, or rum in this case, from the pause screen. 
There's no cooldown on the healing potions, the benefit happens instantly instead of being a gradual restoration, and there's no animation to actually drink the potion. So as long as you can survive the first hit and have rum or grog handy, you're effectively invincible in this game, making defensive skill boosts somewhat unnecessary. The Silver Tongue skill is likewise of questionable value. It seems like it's going to be useful early on because it gets you some extra rewards or bypasses difficult quest solutions and in at least one case is seemingly necessary to complete a quest, but towards the second half of the game it seemed to stop having any kind of consequential impact on the gameplay. For example, there's a guard outside Marigato's house on Caldera who initially won't let you in to see him, but will if you have enough silver tongue to persuade him, except he also lets you in if you don't have enough silver tongue and pick the other option instead and picking the silver tongue option doesn't somehow lead to a better outcome or influence the conversation with Marigato. You don't even get experience points for a successful skill check. Later, when you're in the High Council building trying to find incriminating evidence against Marigato and where Garcia's gotten to, there's a secretary you can persuade, and you'd think that by buttering her up you could get her assistance in some way. But all it gets you is a measly three-word response before you get kicked out of dialogue. Then you've got encounters like the one with Harvey on Antigua, where you think the Silver Tongue option might get you some kind of exclusive insight into Slane's character or background that might contribute to the story in some interesting way, and all it gets you is a single worthless, throwaway line of dialogue that doesn't tell you anything of significance. It's like they just forgot about incorporating Silver Tongue in the gameplay after the first few islands, and by the time they remembered, it was too late to go back and change things, so they just threw in a few pointless interactions to give the illusion of it having some kind of use. Certain skills like animal trophies and ore prospecting are no longer tied to character progression. You just have to buy the right tools from merchants, which is kind of an odd change, but the other crafting skills are weirdly nonsensical. With the distillery skill, you can make your own rum, but it costs the same to buy a full bottle of rum as it does to buy the ingredients necessary to make your own. Except there's also the added cost of buying the recipe and paying a skill trainer to teach you how to do so, so it's actually more expensive to make your own. Why, then, would you want to make your own rum, especially since merchants have an infinitely replenishing stock of rum? For swordsmithing, there are times when a completed sword actually sells for less than the cost of the materials to make the sword, meaning it's more advantageous to just sell the materials individually than to make the sword itself. If you want to get an epi to use in combat, you can buy the blueprint for 1500 gold, or you can just buy a completed epi for 800 gold. For jewelry making, many rings, earrings, and amulets can be purchased fully completed for the same cost as buying the schematic. The schematics themselves, meanwhile, don't tell you what the created jewelry actually does when looking at them in the trade window, so you have to quick save, buy the schematics, look at them in your inventory, decide which ones you actually want, if any, and then reload your save. All of this makes the crafting skills feel largely unnecessary and actually worse than just buying the items outright, so that's effectively another whole avenue of character development that feels underwhelming and unrewarding. Thieving skills have likewise been revamped, with locked chests and pickable pockets having a gradient scale of skill requirements to unlock. Instead of just learning two or three tiers of lockpicking skills to open regular locks, difficult locks, and master locks, locks can now range in skill level anywhere from 10 to 90 in 5 point increments. That's an interesting mechanism in theory, because it adds more depth to the lockpicking skill when you have that greater range of possibilities requiring more commitment to the skill to unlock the full benefits. But it also makes exploration really tedious and frustrating, because that just means you run into many more locked chests that are just barely out of your reach, thus creating more things you have to keep track of and remember to come back to at many more stages of skill development. That feeling of finding a locked chest that you're a measly 5 points shy of opening is incredibly deflating, and it just gets annoying to think, okay, there's a chest at the end of that one plane that needs 45, and I saw one in a cave somewhere that needs 55, and the chest in that hut needs 60, and trying to keep track of which ones are where, and going back to each one every time you reach a new threshold. It's especially unrewarding because so many high-level chests give utterly crap rewards, often containing just a few measly gold pieces, a bottle of rum, and maybe a torch or some provisions. Like, worthless generic rewards that you can find just lying in any old place. For many of those high-level chests, I found I was spending more on skill potions to boost my thievery skill high enough to open them than I was getting back in rewards from the chest itself. Equipment progression is lackluster and underwhelming as well, because there aren't a whole lot of weapons and armor to begin with, and you can find some of the best gear in the game pretty early, which leaves you little subsequent room to grow through new tiers of progression as you find newer and better equipment. 
If you have the Pirate's Clothes DLC, then that's basically all you need armor-wise until you get to Caldera and buy the best armor in the game, which you can actually do before acquiring Slain, Garcia, and Steelbeard's Titan artifacts. For pistols, I managed to steal a version of the Twins pistol before even leaving the prologue, which is tied for the second best base damage value while also having the fastest reload speed, making it arguably the best pistol in the game in terms of damage per second. And if you've learned Voodoo on the second island, you can likewise steal one of the best swords in the game, which rivals the stats of the legendary weaponry that you have to craft from unique parts scattered all over the world before leaving the second island. The weapons and armor aren't even balanced against your character's skill level. There are no stat requirements to use any of this equipment, so there's nothing stopping a low-level character from running around with all the best gear in the game, which is surprisingly easy to accomplish. It's basically like you finish the first island or two and are fully set for the rest of the game, with only maybe one new thing of each equipment type to look forward to progression-wise. On the more technical side of things, the audio-visual effects are something of a mixed bag. There are times when the environments look absolutely gorgeous with the way the sunlight refracts different colors through the air and how it reflects off the water, impressing you with the natural beauty of this world and really drawing you into it, and the pirate shanty towns give off a whimsically quaint affection that really brings the pirate theme to life. Things like the colored lanterns adorning the hovels in Antigua, or how Booz's bar is literally built out of the hull of a ship are fun, creative little touches that make the world feel visually interesting and engaging. But then you've got other environments where it seems like they just kind of haphazardly pasted graphical assets everywhere with no thought to any kind of artistic design or mechanical functioning, or places like Caldera which feel weirdly drab and mundane and whose high council area gives off this weirdly ominous and sinister vibe with the dark, moody lighting and dusty fog effects in conjunction with out of place ancestral temple music. That's a case where the environment looks pretty decent but the atmosphere it creates feels bizarre and inappropriate. Then you've got the animations, which are pretty stiff and awkward the whole way around. Right off the bat, you're presented with some really strange looking animations for the main character, with his sprinting animation looking like he's got a metal rod running up and down his spine and across his shoulder blades, and the jump looking like he's doing a Captain Morgan pose and levitating straight up into the air. Drawing his sword somehow involves no other muscular movement from his entire body except for his right arm, which makes it look like a weird robotic appendage reaching around his body. As previously mentioned, many of the animations and dialogue are cartoonishly exaggerated, sometimes feeling like an alien trying to imitate human body language or like a high school theater student melodramatically overacting. Those are all minor issues that I can tolerate and excuse, however. It's a relatively low-budget game, after all, and there are arguably more important ways for the designers to spend their time and budget. I can put up with a lot of graphical rough edges and crude visual designs in the games I play, but what I find borderline unacceptable and completely inexcusable is how the game seems to render vegetation and level of detail, with trees and plants literally growing and shrinking as you walk towards or away from them, and objects constantly popping in and out of low and high detail at incredibly close distances. And it's not even that they're just changing visual quality as they do that, they're completely altering the shape and form of these things as they switch detail modes. It's all just so visually prominent that it sticks out like a sore thumb and is so much more distracting and unpleasant to look at than if everything were to just stay in their worst looking low detail mode the whole time. The draw distance is so low too that major NPCs and animals abruptly pop in and out of existence. Like, it's not even a gradual fade, they just materialize and dematerialize before your eyes when it seems like they should be well within sight range of your character. I just find it utterly incomprehensible that anyone at Piranha Bytes thought this type of extreme graphical pop-in and unnaturally shape-shifting foliage was acceptable and that it took fan-made mods and patches to fix these problems. The atmosphere is generally pretty good in spite of these graphical issues, however, thanks in large part to the surprisingly good soundtrack. Risen 2 marks the first Piranha Bytes game to be made without Kai Rosenkranz composing the music, and I've long maintained that his music played a crucial role in establishing those games' unique tone and atmosphere. I previously experimented with replacing Gothic 2's soundtrack with stock fantasy music and found that it basically stopped feeling like Gothic, which I feared would be the case with Risen 2's music being outsourced to an independent production company. But as it turns out, they actually did a pretty good job and I actually kind of like it. 
It strikes that perfect balance I'm always looking for of being subtle enough to not distract from the immersion or get too repetitive, while also being interesting enough to be pleasant to listen to. And some of the tracks succeed at evoking strong pirate themes and imagery without being cliche knockoffs of the Pirates of the Caribbean soundtrack or popular pirate drinking songs. I'll even go so far as to say that certain moments evoke a Rosencrantz-esque vibe. The arpeggiated guitar part in one of the outdoor tracks is very much something I could imagine hearing while wandering around certain wooded areas of Gothic 2. None of the tracks individually work for me quite as well as some of Rosencrantz's more standout compositions, but I'm still impressed by the soundtrack overall. The main bit of criticism I can level against the music is that there isn't enough of it, as there are seemingly only two tracks that play when you're exploring out in the wild, and those two tracks play on nearly every single island. So despite the tracks not being repetitive within themselves, it does get repetitive listening to the same two tracks just about everywhere you go. The pirate theme is pretty fun, but seems like it could have been fleshed out some more to really drive the theme home. It's definitely there, seeing as the main story deals directly with feuding pirate captains, and you've got all the novel visual imagery going on with the pirate camps, plus other elements like pet monkeys and parrots, searching for buried treasure, sailing the high seas, and new combat maneuvers that emphasize dirty tricks a pirate might be wont to perform. Come on! You cheated. Pirate. But the actual gameplay with all of this feels somewhat cursory in nature. There's no actual gameplay with sailing the high seas, for instance. It's basically just a scene transition cutscene, and your ship serves barely any function other than to service the story of how you get from island to island. Hunting for buried treasure likewise amounts to toggling a map marker and going straight to the indicated spot. There's no adventure component of following clues and overcoming traps and puzzles to make it feel like anything more than just a generic quest marker. The sole exception being the Treasure Isle DLC, which is too little, too late, and locked behind a paywall anyway. So for as fun as the pirate theme can be at times, a good portion of it feels like it's been pasted on, sort of like how healing potions are now rum and grog, and other things like the gimmicky minigames are kinda stupid. I appreciated all the pirate stuff, but I rarely ever felt like an actual pirate. And for crying out loud, there aren't even any Muppets in it. Big fat, ugly, bug-faced, baby-eating O'Brien? Hi. There are other weird technical issues too, like the mouse sensitivity which is overly restrictive on the vertical axis, making it extremely cumbersome to look up or down, or how the game stores every single save individually and is constantly auto-saving brand new files by default, making save file management an absolute nightmare. In my case, after turning the autosave function off in the prologue, I wound up with 1,224 save files en route to finishing the game, accounting for over 7 gigabytes of hard disk space, which is greater than the install size of the whole game. That's not such a big deal in this day and age, but was definitely taxing on smaller hard drives back in 2012, especially if you were using a lower capacity solid state drive, which were typically only 128 gigs back then. The game was also plagued with performance issues when it first launched, but fortunately a lot of these issues have been ironed out with official patches and more powerful modern hardware, but the game is still poorly optimized as evidenced by how difficult, if not impossible, it is to get frame rates over 60 frames per second while also fixing all the obnoxious pop-in and rendering issues, which you wouldn't think would be a problem on a computer that's nearly 10 times more powerful than the game's recommended requirements. To top it all off, I experienced numerous crashes throughout my playthrough, some of which were so extreme and so persistent that I had to completely uninstall the game and wipe every file from the hard drive and then reinstall it just to get it working again. Some of that may have been due to compatibility issues running an older game on a modern operating system, but the game definitely had crashing issues when it first launched too, so I can't give it the complete benefit of the doubt. Finally, I should address the DLC, the two big ones of which are Treasure Isle and the Air Temple, which cost $5 each and give you one extra island with an extra hour or two of content per DLC. As I mentioned previously, it feels like these islands were cut from the game in order to artificially raise the cost by selling extra islands piecemeal, effectively turning the full $50 game into a $60 purchase. Treasure Isle especially feels like something that was cut out from the base game, since that whole questline was a direct continuation of a major plot arc from the first game and feels out of place not being in the base game. 
This seems to be corroborated by the fact that all the DLC apparently shipped on the initial game disc and could be unlocked through console commands. Buying the DLC merely activated them officially and allowed you to download the language files, the only thing missing from the initial release. That's a pretty shady business practice, and for that reason alone I can't recommend them, but they're also just not very fun or interesting to be necessarily worth the cost either. Patty's quest on Treasure Isle at least gives you some character moments with her and resolves the plot arc that began way back on Faranga in the first game, so it's kind of worth it to do that. And it's one of few buried treasure quests in the game that actually feel like a pirate adventure, but it's still pretty short and underwhelming. The Air Temple, on the other hand, is pure tedium as the whole thing basically amounts to kill a bunch of gargoyles and collect eggs, follow a linear path to the temple killing more gargoyles and collecting eggs and closing geysers, then go to every other island to fight more gargoyles. It's mind-numbingly simple and repetitive. It does bring back another character from Risen 1, the Druid Eldrick, but they didn't do a whole lot with his character and so it just feels like a wasted opportunity. Therefore, I can't recommend the Air Temple at all. In reviewing Risen 2, I find it difficult to make much of an impassioned argument one way or the other. I don't dislike it enough to say, this game sucks and here's why, and I don't like it enough to argue it's underappreciated and better than its reputation either. The whole thing is kind of blah to me, and thus I simply find myself extremely apathetic about it. In truth, writing such an in-depth review of it, especially at this point, nearly 10 years after its release, feels like more work and effort than this game deserves, because the overall package is just so thoroughly mediocre that it was a struggle for me to find the motivation to write this review at all. The big problem with Risen 2 is that anyone who was hoping for a new and improved version of Risen 1 didn't get that with Risen 2, since everything, from the theme, setting, and even the story, down to the actual gameplay mechanics, was so radically different that it may as well have been a completely different game altogether. In that regard, it didn't live up to expectations, and thus could be seen as a pretty disappointing game. And for anyone going into Risen 2 without the preconceived expectations of the first game, who just wants to judge it as its own standalone pirate-themed action-adventure RPG, you're left with a game with lots of frustrating rough edges and missed potential reminiscent of other low-budget games that typically aren't as good as more polished products from more prominent developers. In other words, I don't think it did a very good job of appealing to established fans of the first game, and I'm not sure it does a very good job of appealing to prospective newcomers either. Obviously, people are free to enjoy it as much as they like, and I can't fault anyone who finds their own entertainment with it, but I think it's safe to say that Risen 2 is one of Piranha Bytes' weaker games because it just doesn't operate on the same level as their own pedigree, and despite trying to take inspiration from other, more popular developers like Bioware, it doesn't live up to those standards of expectation either. Ultimately, it feels like a game that was kind of confused about its own identity, as if Piranha Bytes are trying to shift their design philosophies to appeal to a wider audience while losing sight about what worked so well with their own formula. That's not to say their approach with Risen 2 can't work, as I actually like some of the things they tried to do with it. For instance, the storytelling is some of the most interesting and engaging that Piranha Bytes have ever done, and the non-linear chapter progression with each island housing its own chapter of the story are two things that work solidly in the game's favor. Plus, the pirate theme is kind of fun if you're into that. It's just that the bulk of the gameplay systems feel poorly thought out and very crudely implemented. I think with a different combat system, more consideration put into the world building, more rewarding exploration, and a more effective progression system, this could have been a solid little game. As it is, the whole thing leans towards being more frustrating and underwhelming than satisfying, and thus rates pretty low on the Piranha Bytes grading scale for me.